Hello and welcome to the Tech Food Lazy Marketing Hour. Uh, I think we've got a treat in store for you today. No trick, and that's not a cheap reference to Halloween. Okay, it is. Uh, forgive me, uh, but that's how we're going to roll today. Uh, let me introduce the panel and the topic. Today, we're going to be talking about the impact of personal brand on business and why I and many others here today hopefully agree or may, they may disagree. We'll find out. Uh, believe that the the power of the individual has significant value for the business, which most businesses are overlooking. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the algorithms and a whole lot more. Let me introduce you to the panel first. Um, every month, we're delighted to have uh, Rachel not with us. Say hello, Rachel. Hello. Fantastic copywriter, content genius extraordinaire. Uh, next up, we have a no particular order. I'm just going down my screen. We have the fantastic Simon Hutchings, creative genius. Hello, Simon. Hello. Hello. And last, but by no means least of our regular monthly panel, we have Adam Cockrell, the digital legend himself. Hello, Adam. Hello. And without any massive build up, let me introduce you to the phenomenal Carl Reader. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more about him, but hello, Carl. Yeah, good to be here. Thank you so much. Carl, I've known and heard uh, Carl speak many times over the last probably 15 years. I don't want to make you sound too old, Carl, but that's the truth. Um, and every time he he speaks, I just furiously find myself with loads of notes at the end. Pay attention. It's going to be a whirlwind. He is the author of Boss It. I think Boss It is out now, or is it it's due yeah. out now? It's out now. Uh, you can get it uh, in place like WH Smith. Find this man on the internet, follow him, listen to him, and get a copy of the book. Trust me, uh, it's golden stuff. We're going to dive straight in, and I'm going to go straight to Carl, because personal brand is a topic that I know is important to all of us, but I'm pretty sure he's got a seriously uh, interesting perspective. So, Carl, how do you feel about personal brand and business? Where's the line? What are we doing right and wrong? Wow. So this is a subject that I could talk about for hours and hours on end, but I'm going to try and keep it as concise as possible now, because I'm conscious this is the lazy hour, not the lazy day. Um, so personal brand to me has been vital in terms of what I've done, certainly over the last decade. And it wasn't always that way. So if you don't mind, please allow me to set the scene of how I came to a point and a decision where I decided that actually a personal brand was a good thing to think about. So if we rewind back, back in my life, I'm not going to go as far as the midwife holding me up by my feet. But I'm actually going to go to when I started in business. And when I first joined um, the professional world, I joined as an accountant at the age of 16. And I joined without having any degrees or A-levels and so on. I actually left school before my GCSEs. And as you can imagine, that was a world where I had to fake it to make it. And faking it to make it meant that I had to... Um, basically look older than I was, I had to look more successful than I was, and I had to walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, so how did that, uh, how did that um, permeate itself in the real world? It meant that at the age of 20 to 21-ish, I bought a BMW on HP, because as an accountant, you want to be looking like you're successful, but not too successful. So you have the choice between a three series, a C class and an A4. That was the accountant car range that you could go for. I went to Geeves and Hawks and I couldn't afford a bespoke suit, but I bought one off the rail and yeah, obviously made sure that I always had the suit on, the tie done up, all of this stuff. And um, presenting the image that I believed an accountant needed to present. Now, at that point, I actually wasn't doing accountancy. In truth, I was doing sales at that stage because I'd already worked out that somebody who's got ADHD doesn't make a very good accountant. But I had the gift of a gab and I was able to speak to business owners and relate to them. Anyway, that was that's the basis. And then over time, um, so from, you know, I started in that world in 97, started going out meeting clients sort of 2000, 2001. 2007, I um, bought out the business that I was in. And at that point, we started to scale it. And um, we did pretty well at scaling it, but we used the methodology of Michael E. Gerber from The E-Myth Revisited. Now, for those of you who haven't read The E-Myth Revisited, it's all about systemization and process. But there's an equation that Michael Gerber shares that I believe is totally and utterly outdated. And he says that ordinary people plus extraordinary systems equal extraordinary businesses. And that was the ethos of many businesses in the sort of the early to mid 2000s. 
was that they tried to become um, anonymous in terms of the founders. You'd hear people say, don't put your name above the door. You'd hear people actively suggest that you move away from that and appear to be a bigger corporate machine. And the penny dropped over, over time. I realized as I kind of found myself and understood what life was about to me, bear in mind when I um, bought the business out and scaled it up, I was only 26. And I was probably quite young to be running a multi-million pound firm at that point. But I, um, I began to learn more about myself and I noticed that there was a real disconnect and there was a disconnect in business. And I don't believe I was the first person to share this on stage um, because I know that everybody shares it now. And I know that there was at least five people who I know who were sharing it at the same time I was sharing, which is that business is no longer B2B or B2C. It's H to H, human to human. And I noticed that where we'd followed this systemization path and a focus on the machine rather than the people, we'd become detached from our clients. Now, myself and Al were talking just in the waiting room before this webinar about the fact that we met at a PR course. And something that I, I'd started to realize before I did that was that actually there was a different way and that as people, we tend to connect better with other people than with businesses. And I noticed it on my own social media feeds. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not an avid follower of um, various corporates. I follow people. I follow my family. I follow my mates. I follow, um, you know, the influencers that I'm interested in. I, I follow um, those who are living life rather than selling something. So I noticed that myself and I realized that also it was a whole lot easier to get in the press if you're getting in the press as an individual rather than as a business. Because if you get in as a business, it's an advert or possibly a well-written PR piece. If you get in the press as an individual, it's just so much more relatable and, and it just happens. Um, I went on an active path of trying to build this stuff up from about 2017, I believe it was. Um, so winter of 2006 no sorry 2016 so winter of 2015 um i unfortunately lost access to two of my kids and i'll come back to that in a moment because that's a that's a critical part of this journey and um i was i realized that i wanted to up my game in terms of content so i went on online and tried to find some courses and i found one from gary vaynerchuk who wasn't as well known then he was known as the wine guy at that point um but he had just written his i think crush it he'd written so one of the first books and and started to make a name for himself in the personal branding space um i i watched one of his videos and there was a saying that resonated with me an audience of one is better than an audience of none and that was like, wow, that, yeah, that, that was actually really powerful to me. But actually, it doesn't matter if you're only speaking to one person, get the message out there. If you've got a message you want to share, get it out there. So in January 2016, I, um, I picked myself a bit of a plan. And my plan, my target was to make sure that I got one bit of coverage or interview or something per day. That was it. So one month. One bit of coverage per day. Let's see what came out at the end of it. So I was going out like a madman. Um, quite honestly, I was responding to journal requests. I was connecting with journalists. I was speaking to bloggers. I was doing whatever I could. I got five pieces of national coverage in that first month. Okay. And as I was doing that, I realized that actually there was a bit of a space that I wanted to fill which was to be the Martin Lewis of small business. There was no relatable face for small business at that time. You had the likes of, um, you know, the guy of the red braces, Justin Urquhart Stewart, who represented the city and the financiers of the stock market and so on. You had obviously Martin Lewis for personal finance. But there was no relatable person in the small business world. It was either, um, it, it was either the train bodies, you have the FSBs and so on of this world, or it was people who just didn't represent those on the ground. Um, over time, that, that kind of scaled up. So I took on a content team by about April or May. I took on a publicist by that point. Um, I had a book published, The Startup Coach, and um, that was pretty much by accident. The publishers, Hodder and Stout, and gave me a contract. Didn't know what I was signing, but I signed it. I just signed my life away and took it. Second book, Franchising Handbook. Third book, as you mentioned, Boss It. 
And then since then, I've um, really pounded the personal branding um, part of what I do. I've been on, um, yeah, every TV channel. I've been on every radio station, been on every national newspaper apart from Sunday Sport. So I still need to get in there at some point, but I don't think they'll have me, unfortunately. Um, But yes, I have done the Daily Star and so on. Um, And yeah, I'm I'm a really big believer. To summarise and come back to the question that you asked, Dale, I'm a big believer that um, individuals should embrace who they are and work on their personal brand. Even if they don't want to become known, I think that personal brand is so much more than just social media followers and, um, and a platform. It's actually a whole lot more than that beneath it. And I think that corporates need to, um, and this is where I might upset a few people, I think corporates need to get over themselves and lose some of the barriers that they put in their own way and actually allow their people to flourish. Because if their people aren't good enough, why the hell are they employed? That's my piece. Over to you guys. Brilliant. Let me just dive in first and say what a journey, first of all, and what a testimony to the power of personal brand. And, and then ending there with, you know, that that initial shot across the bow of corporate, you know, uh, that's a good place for us to start, I think, for the rest of the panel. Um, you, you've all worked with corporates, you know, Adam uh, on the digital marketing web end, Rachel on the content and copy end, Simon certainly uh, for uh, many more years than, than all of us, apart from me, certainly, but working with lots of corporates at a very, you know, high level, Microsoft and people like that. Um, wh- why don't they get over themselves? What stops them? unlocking in your view what stops them unlocking uh the the power of their people i mean that sounds quite revolutionary but what what stops them what do we think is going on guys who wants to say something first i'll jump in uh i think from a web perspective my in my experience um clients are, yeah are generally very reluctant to show their face on their website their about page they're quite often up for maybe having a team page and, and talking about some of the team members but really personalizing their brand and brand experience through who they are uh generally quite reluctant to do so smaller businesses and uh, non-corporates um you know small kind of one-man bads uh, and and sole traders again i think a little bit reluctant to i think it comes down to personality perhaps being a little bit shy about putting you know that that being the face of the business online um and you know there, there's fear around it we, the, generally the the business owners i speak to weren't of the generation that has been brought up now where you know they were on their phones all the time on social media posting about their lives so i think there's quite a barrier to overcome in terms of their perspectives on it and and how powerful it is and how important it is and how useful it is um, to do so. But it, there's also a, a challenge between presenting the business and the corporate identity in relation to corporate businesses and, and marrying that with the personality of the brand. And especially if they haven't defined it, you know, which, which a lot of our I think all of our clients you know, uh, probably haven't necessarily gone through that exercise and define their tone of voice, define their brand identity and their brand messaging and how that lines up with who they are and and who's in the business. So can I just chip in, Adam? I think that, and sorry, Al did warn all of the panellists, but I like the sound of my own voice. Um, But if I can just chip in, um, I think there's a piece around ego here. And often it's believed that to have a personal brand, you've got to have an overinflated ego. Mm. And I think that there's actually three parts to it. I think that there's got to be a commercial justification. I think there's got to be an ego justification. You want to be heard. And there's also got to be sort of a driving force behind it, which was what I mentioned for kids. I wanted them to be able to Google me and find me. Um, So I think that you need to have a, a number of things there. But actually, when it comes to small businesses, so we've talked about corporates and we've we've shared the likes of Microsoft and so on. And I can share some input from some brands I've worked with as a um, brand ambassador in the B2B space. Um, and I think they're a very different um, case than small businesses. I think small businesses, it's actually their ego that is the problem here. And it's not the, those who've got personal brands that have got the ego. It's the small businesses who want the business card to say CEO of my own poxy little business. Um, it's the ego that they want to be seen as a bigger corporate machine when it's actually John and John's doing whatever John has always done. 
The reality is the people who buy them, John or Julie or whoever it is, are dealing with that person. They're not dealing with the business. If John's business dissolved today and he set up a new company tomorrow, I can guarantee that John will have the same customers provided he didn't shaft them in the old business because they're doing business with John, not John's limited company PLC. Yeah, and I find that with my own business that um, really it's the relationships that I'm building as the front man, as the person who's you know driving the sales and marketing. It, and even when I onboard a client and I introduce them to the rest of the team members, um, you know, Rachel and Simon may may be on board in the project and liaise with the client directly. Um, you know, they they're still the first port of call is still for them to text or call me, you know, because that's that's I'm the person who's developed that initial um, relationship and, and contact with them. That That's so. Yeah. I, and, and I find that's that's challenging to, you know, offset that, you know, that that's the connection they have. I think that's a very valid point. And there's absolutely no shame in that as well. I mean, we live in we live in a world now where um, everybody who happens to be responsible for their own income is an entrepreneur rather than a freelancer or a contractor or a consultant or whatever. And I, I don't particularly gel with that personally. I think that for me, we should just be true to who we are and, um, and yeah, just, just do what we do. But we've got this... Um, perceived need to demonstrate that we're bigger and better and bolder than we actually are um and the reality is our customers can see straight through it so why mm. not just work on your personal brand and amplify who you really are which is what they're buying anyway but there's a lot of resistance i find and yeah i think it do does come down to ego that a lot of business owners don't want to be marketeers you know they don't want to accept that their role is has to be salesperson and marketeer to a certain extent especially if it is john who runs his own little plumbing company or something like that um they want to maybe offload that or outsource it but you know they they don't want to be a part of it but even if they were to outsource all of their social media marketing and all the rest of it it's still john who the customers are dealing with and if we can't put his face into anything then we can't do an effective job it's interesting just saying what Carl said, you know, just a minute ago about, um, you know, smaller businesses or people wanting to make themselves sound bigger. And actually, you can kind of relate that through your through probably most people, mine especially and timeline across their career. So when you're really junior in your position, you're trying to build your personal brand within a business because either you're trying to go up the, the you know to get to a senior position in a business. So you need to be known for having a level of authority and expertise to be able to get you to that level. And then also for ne your next career path into other businesses or into other agencies, you know, you it, with any hope you'll go for an interview or you'll get headhunted. And if you've got headhunted, that's because they've worked out a way of finding you. They've understood who you are. You've sold yourself before you even had the interview because they've headhunted you. Um, and then you're building your, you know, throughout that process, we're all kind of, without really realizing, going through a process of building our personal brand. However, where we hit the top and then it starts going back or we go back down again is oh well I think I'm going to start my own business so we we get to a point where we we're, we're being successful we are being headhunted we're moving up the ladder quite nicely but then we get to a point where we want to branch out and do our own thing and like you said Cole it's kind of like but now I've got to seem bigger than what I am to get those contracts um and actually we don't, you know, you know, a lot of the businesses that I work with, I've been working with for 12, 14 years. Why? Because they bought into me. Um, you know, the fact that I've got a team now is, is kind of, it doesn't make any difference really, because those guys are bought into me as the first contact for the business. Mm. So for those people who have, you know, decide, right, I'm going to start my own business. I need to make myself bigger. That's that's the critical point there, isn't it? Because like if they if they just switch on cor the corporate switch and forget about everything they've done so far, the likelihood is it's not going to work out brilliantly. But if they've still got this understanding of how they need to grow their business through them um, initially until they get much, much bigger, potentially. And um, then, you know, they're, they're on the same path going forwards. Just playing the devil's advocate, isn't there some validity to that approach? I've certainly had a lot of prospect prospects 
um, you know, ask me, you know, is it just you, Adam? Do you have a team? You do employ them? Where do you work? You know, do you work out of an office? And I feel like a lot of these questions are, are fairly irrelevant, you know, because however the business is structured, it doesn't really matter. It's about what value am I adding as a service? And what's the output? And are we going to get you to where you need to be? You know, my business, how it's structured and how I deliver it, that's really, you know, nothing to do with the client. But there is a, a an expectation, I think, generally that, well, you can only produce the result that we need if you if I line you up against my expectation of what a, a digital agency should look like. I'm going to come back to that topic because it's about risk and marketing. In my world, marketing is all about lowering risk. I'll come back to that. But Rachel has been dying to say something, Rachel. She's far too polite. <laughs> She's far too polite to butt in. So Rachel... What do you? I hope I hope it's something brilliant and substantive and exciting now that I built it up. You know, it's going to be amazing now, hasn't it? I I was just going to just going back to the um, the conversation about looking bigger than you are. So this is often something that my clients say to me: make us sound big, make us sound bigger than we are. They they admit it. They say it straight out, and I totally get that because you want to seem like you're you're you know you're a very successful company. You know you're growing you have you have the capacity to take on the kind of work that you're pitching for and all of that it's totally valid and what I usually say to them is you know it, it they they underestimate the power of personal story in that because even the big corporate brands that we write for it comes down to personal story like it, it's not when I say to people tell me that tell me the story behind your business they'll start telling me about you know when it was founded and then when they um, when they brought in um, another director and their credentials, and I'm like, no, 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 what did you what did you see in the world that you wanted to change? And they're like, oh, okay, um, well, that's a challenging question. I've actually got to think about why I'm really doing this. And if you can get to the crux of that, then you've got a personal story that people can buy into. And it doesn't matter how big your company is, that story is what sells. Spot on, spot on. Couldn't couldn't agree more with that. And I think that if we look at, um, yeah, if, if we look at the personal branding landscape, um, and we've touched on businesses wanting to look bigger than they are, and so on. Um, the reality is, but if we think about some of the biggest businesses that we know of, um, you know, one very relevant to um, personal branding, I guess, is Tesla and PayPal and Twitter with Elon Musk. Um, you've got Apple with Steve Jobs. You've got Walt Disney at, at Disney. Um, uh, personal brand isn't limited to just small businesses that are trying to become more relatable. Actually, it's um, it seems to be working across the board and across the scale. And we we touched on the fact that there are some corporates who um, don't align with it. And I can think of some very big brands who I've worked with, and it's been a very real struggle to get any communication out. Um, because of the corporate tone of voice and what they are and aren't allowed to say um, pretty much there's five words in the dictionary that you are allowed to say and that's it good luck um, but yeah the, the story itself I think is is so powerful Rachel and it's um it's not just you know th those listening might be thinking about those horrendous hero journeys that they've heard before and you can tell when it's inauthentic and you can tell when it's been um, padded out and built up to try and build a personal brand but if you're relatable if you're authentic and it comes from the heart and it actually is your story rather than a story that's been written for PR it's really powerful. Mm. So is, is the evolution of personal brand into corporate culture? Is the, Say that again is what's the question is the is it is there a logical progression so is the evolution yeah, it's an, of it's your an own personal brand into corporate? It's an inevitability it's yeah, an inevitability. Yeah. So I just want I just want to throw some thoughts out because I've been sat here very quietly notating and bombs are going off in my brain. Right. The first thing is it's totally a generational issue. And in 20 years, no one will be asking why corporates aren't leveraging personal brand because they all will be. I can guarantee it. I'm absolutely if I'm certain of anything in marketing, I'm certain that personal brand is coming. It's here. It's, it's just coming for the mainstream. It's here in the fringes today. We have social CEOs all over the place. Um, uh, you know, think of almost any big brand that you support or buy into, and there's probably a social CEO involved in it. Stephen Bartlett, uh, Elon Musk, um, Theo Pafitis, even before social, these people uh, were visible 
through various forms of media. And now they're super social. You look at what people like that are doing. Look at people like um, Steve Jobs, who who mastered messaging to the extent that if Apple launched a new, he, he's been dead for years and his personal brand is still so powerful that if he launched a new phone by just changing the front image on the apple.com website, a billion people would know about it in about 20 minutes. Now that is personal brand. The next thing I want to say, so generationally, if you're watching this and you're thinking, well, I was born in the 60s, 70s or 80s and I don't really agree with this. My personal life is my personal life. Get out of the way because they're coming for you. And every every small business is going to eat your lunch because we live in a world where people buy from people. You know, uh, I, I roll this quote out an awful lot and it's so true. Frank Zappa said a computer could tell you a story, but it can't tell you the whole story. It just doesn't have the eyebrows. We've got the eyebrows. It's all about human communication. Um, the other thing is, as we move from a broadcast to a social world, what's changing? And we talked about this a bit in the green room, and I, I may not have got my point across perfectly, but the algorithms are driving acceleration of this change because the algorithms do not want to, in the same way that a national newspaper does not want to give your company free ad space, but it will give your founder with a brilliant founder story free ad space, but it won't give your corporation. The same is true of the networks. Facebook, LinkedIn, Google do not want to reward your company with free ad space. You can pay for that. And what that's doing from the bottom up is it's driving small businesses away from paid spend, which is why in the last couple of years we've seen Google and Facebook report terrible quarters. The numbers are there. We're seeing the trends. We've reached peak paid. I don't care what anyone says. We've reached peak paid. The proof of that is evident to me. It doesn't mean paid's going. It's still very valuable. But the reason we've reached peak paid is because most small businesses aren't going to have the budget to compete on that level. So personal brand is a necessity because it's all they've got. The next thing I'll say is personal brand isn't a bad thing. I love that you mentioned ego. Some people worry that if they have a personal brand, Carl, that you know somehow it's going to be seen as terrible. No, when you're a small business, you've got very little in the locker to play with. So you've got to work with what you've got to play with. Now, the smart kids of today, age 15, 16 and 17, are setting up LinkedIn accounts now. They're starting to build their personal brands now. Never mind starting a pension and watching the compound interest for 20 years on that. Start a personal brand when you're 15. Watch the, watch the compound interest on that over 20 years. Imagine what your career will look like in 20 years if you've been leveraging your network for all that time. And the last point to make is uh, about risk. And Adam, I think you brought this point up perfectly. People, everyone wants to look bigger. Everyone wants to look bigger because the customer thinks that if you're bigger, you're less a risk to go with. Whereas if you're a startup, that's why most larger corporations won't work with people that are too small. That's why they have procurement departments to make sure that we're not doing a deal with someone that could disappear because that's their perception of small businesses. The reality is totally not true. It's totally not that. You, you, companies are, are not taking risks by staying quiet and not letting their people be visible. They're actually committing the worst possible act they could to increase risk over time. But most companies are short termist. So my, my question out of all of that, I think really speaks to the generational issue. Do you think uh, do you think this is an age issue? Do you think that companies set with CEOs in their 50s and 60s today aren't going to get it? And it's going to take that younger generation to come through. Do you think the millennials are going to smash it because of it? Good question. Um, so for me, social media was really easy because um, you know, I was born as a er very early millennial. Um, and as I went through um, school and then, yeah, you know, I went back to college for a couple of weeks and yeah, didn't get on with it. But at that time, I remember quite clearly that it was the first time that I'd seen a computer with the internet, believe it or not, um, was going into the um, college in September 97, I think it was. And there was a website. I don't know if anyone remembers the Kids TV channel, Trouble. I don't know if you yeah. ever remember that, anyone? But yeah, there was a Kids TV channel that was aimed at um, younger teenagers than that. But it was actually the first website that, that we found as a as a group, as our class, that had a, a bit of a social media. It was a chat forum. So 
we were there and we were just messing around on it, sending insults to each other and so on. And hence why I wasn't in college after a couple of weeks. And from there, I guess I saw firsthand the path of AOL and ICQ and MSN Messenger and MySpace and Bebo and all of these things. So it, it's been, I, I guess, second nature for me to, um, to perhaps overshare. Um, I know certainly my missus will think that I overshare, not undershare. <laughs> so, uh, yes, there might be an argument to say that it's a generational thing. But let, let's be honest, what was stopping, you know, when I was 16, what was stopping a 26-year-old starting to look at these things and go through that same journey? What was stopping a 36-year-old go through that journey? You know, we, um, we're looking at social media now and there's new um, apps coming out and we're jumping onto them. and. I guess an, an, a, 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 a situation today that we could look at that's similar is crypto and NFTs. You know, NFTs might have been deemed to be something for kids to be playing around with and so on. But I'm sure that as well as 16-year-olds toying around with it, there's 26, 36, 46, 56-year-olds toying around with it. So I don't necessarily buy that it was a generational thing. I think that with the corporates, I mean, there's a... An assumption that I think is fair fair to make that the bigger the corporate, it tends to be the older and the greyer and the whiter and the more male the CEO. Um, it tends to be a, a you know, unfortunately, the situation we're in and that will change over time. Um, but I actually think with the corporates, it's not necessarily the person who is the CEO, because in theory, if they're voted to be the CEO by the shareholders. They should have good ideas. They should have vision, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's actually the corporate machines behind it that limit the um, ability to change quickly. I think it's the fact that there's marketing departments. You've all got set goals and targets and procedures and policies and the way they do things and the way they don't do things. But actually trying to rip up the rule book and start again and say, right, we're going to and put personal touch first and everybody from CEO down to cleaner is going to be on social and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's too much of a step for them to take, even if they wanted to. Yeah. yeah. So something, something just came, came to mind on that. I mean, I, I wonder whether some of this is also down to targeting. So is it, could, could there be a difference between how businesses are seeing um people to people interaction between b to b and b to c as an example so i'm just thinking thinking about kind of all the because al touched on you know facebook ads and stuff like that and how they can target people so for if people are using facebook ads then you can be very uh, precise in in who you're targeting so you're type targeting this type of person of this type of age who likes these types of things that has bought into and like these types of pages so you're building a picture of that person from a consumer perspective when we go and and i find this when we're working with businesses to develop their branding and things we go who's your target market and they say it's this kind of business with at this size with these kind of people the, this number of people um being employed um they're they're in this area and actually what they're not thinking about is we're targeting this person in that business who is of this age who likes to do this who reads these this kind of content so i'm wondering whether there's a misunderstanding of between targeting for b2b and b2c and it, obviously it needs to be more over b2b the b2b side because you know we are that's what linkedin's for you know we are connecting to to people but the error has been historically that b2b think we're focusing our, our efforts on marketing to a biz a type of business rather than we are focusing our efforts on trying to market to a person within that type of business oh. Simon, that is spot on. I'm thinking about a brand that I started working with as a brand ambassador. So typically my brand ambassador roles will involve going to media days, speaking on radio or whatever, on behalf of the brand, um, speaking as myself, but trying to weave in some key messaging. Um, and there's a brand that I started working with and it very quickly became more of a consultancy exercise, doing exactly that, as you say, um, because they had a clear definition of the kind of business they wanted to work with. But 
not only have they not targeted the individuals and yeah, the stakeholders within any buying decision, um, but they hadn't even um, considered what they might look like. They, they, hadn't, they hadn't thought about this at all. They thought about the entity that they were trying to sell to rather than the, the those who signed the check, those who influenced the decision to sign the check, and those who were going to complain about the check being signed. Yeah. Um, and that, that is a massive, I mean, that's going away from personal branding to some extent. Um, to me, that was just common sense and this business hadn't seen it. But um, I, I do think as well, one of the challenges that marketing departments have with any kind of um, change or um, openness towards personal branding is that potentially there's a bit of a risk of turkeys voting for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember, certainly as businesses get bigger, a good proportion of marketing's job isn't putting messages out there. It's stopping messages getting out there. And it's control. about protecting yeah, control and protecting the brand rather yeah. than amplifying the brand. Yeah. And I think that that is um, it, it's a it's a necessary duty at the moment, but solely because they've not helped encourage the right culture and mm -hmm. way of doing things. But actually, we can all see could be there in the future. Well, I already. Oh, sorry, H. Go on. You go, and then I'll go. Oh no, I, I was just going to say we were talking about this about this in the green room earlier. But it's it, it, the the wise move, the smart move would, would be to invest in that in the right way and to get ahead of that curve. So you know, educate your employees, talk to them, train them. There there are tools out there to be able to do this. You know, give them give them guidelines to follow. Give them give them training on it so they know what they're doing. It's not just a case of, oh, if you go and build your personal brand right wherever you want, you know, you can, there is a certain amount of control around it. And the, the brilliant thing about that, and I know Al, this is something that you're very passionate about, is that by giving your people that ownership of the brand, you're actually getting them even more behind your brand and the brand mm. become more cohesive than ever. So it becomes, you know, the brand becomes a whole team of people not just you know a set of guidelines that the marketing team are following it's well, everybody is behind the business and the brand i would go further and say it is a team of people it's just we've convinced ourselves it's not a team of people and yeah the, the evidence is there the numbers are there and i mentioned the stat in the green room, uh, green room and i'll mention it again it's a couple of years old but but this stat is so astounding that it holds water even though i haven't got an updated version for you and the stat is that you're 24 more times you're 24 times more likely to close and win business from a personal post on LinkedIn than you are from a commercial post on LinkedIn. If that doesn't make every business owner listening to this absolutely revisit and reassess how much risk is costing them, how much the fear of, uh, uh, you know, coaching up and unleashing their people uh, is costing them by keeping their people closeted away somehow they're protecting the brand it's a delusion it's an mm. absolute delusion and there's evidence of companies there's evidence of companies getting this there are social ceos leading businesses um drift for example uh there are uh, uh, uh i can't remember um dave uh gerhardt who was uh at drift the cmo at drift uh built a personal brand whilst he was at Drift, did a brilliant job at Drift, and then went on, got another role, and now uh, has built such a strong personal brand, has his own marketing community, paying him every month with thousands of people in it, because yeah. he's now exited working for businesses, and his future is along his path. But businesses think they control the career trajectory of their employees. They don't. But also, here's, here's the thing, Al. The, um, the reason why I believe corporates are so scared is because their culture becomes their brand. So, yeah. you know, if they yeah. open the doors to allowing their team to have a voice and share their own voice, um, what is the internal culture becomes their brand? The thing is, they're deluded by not fixing this problem first. If they believe they've got a problem, they need to fix their culture issue first. Because yeah. ultimately, all that they're doing is rather than artificially um, peppering their marketing with brand guidelines and so on. Um, all they're doing is then causing the culture shock to come in after the first or second or third interaction with the business. So they're just delaying the inevitable. Yes. They're trying to get the revenue first. 
and then and and then they'll take off their robes and 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 fess up to who they really are. Well, mm. none of us think that's a good idea because yeah. the more real you are at the beginning, the better. And also, um, all of us. I, I mean, I can you know, Rachel, Adam, and Simon. I know we talk a lot about winning the business we want to win as well. And the problem when you're when you're wearing when you're wearing an outfit or when you're wearing a disguise, you're not going to win the business you want to win anyway. So from a from a commercial and from a scalable enterprise perspective, I understand the pressure is all revenue led, quarter led, you know, there's a totally different shareholder pressure. And yet still, and yet still, the proof is there. Look at how much they invest on identity and identity control. Whereas if they didn't worry about the control bit, imagine how many more times stronger their identity would be without even trying. And, and this is, there's an evolutionary process happening here. It's not an overnight revolution, it's evolutionary. And some people get it and some people don't, and some people will push it, but it won't be long. It won't be long before companies are behaving this way everywhere we see. And certainly, all, all four of us, what you see is what you get. I don't want to work with people who don't want to work with me anyway. And and why would I give you a false impression of who I am there for? I just, I just encourage the wrong people to want to work with me. Well, that wouldn't serve me anyway. So there's a reality check coming to that delusion, Carl, I think, uh, inevitably. Adam. Can I just ask for clarification? Um, we're talking about personal brand. We're also talking about, you know, corporate brand business um you know with, with teams in what's the difference between you know brand culture and personal brand and are we talking about personal brand as it relates to an individual sort of spokesperson for the company or are we talking about personal brand in terms of the the corporate brand identity being personalized can i go first so, simon uh, oh go I, on carl no, go on, i go. was just i was just gonna say um i i think that they're one and the, I think brand is one and the same. It's across a business. And we're talking personal brand as if it's somebody who's tried to design a personal brand. So let, let's say the personal brand 101. You've watched some YouTube videos. You've set up a social media account. You've gained some followers. You then go on a course on copywriting and using Canva to create those little slides. And I don't know why people do that, but they do. Um, and you've gone down the um, personal branding 101 to then sell your five day challenge and all of that nonsense. Um, that's what people think about when they think of personal brand. Every single person has got a personal brand. Adam, you've got a personal brand. Simon, you've got one. Rachel, you've got one. Al, you've got one. And I've got to know your personal brands better over the space of this call. Um, my next door neighbor, you know, on that side, my next door neighbor is probably late 70s, early 80s. But they've got a personal brand. And we've all got a personal brand and that personal brand is effectively what people say about us what people feel about us in the interactions what they remember about us and so on that's that's personal brand it's not a it's not necessarily a designed tool that people use so when we talk about corporate brand and personal brand a corporate brand we know that it's not just the logo we know that it's not just the website we know that it's not just the color scheme it's it's the whole of the um brand feeling and i do apologize for the dog going off in the background i will i will finish up quickly it's the um it's the whole feeling and the buzz that people get the personal brands that make up a company are part of that company brand uh, so how does that, in, oh go on sorry just to ask for further clarification there how does that then if you've got 10 people in the business, they've all got different personal brands and you've got, you know, how does that kind of line up with trying to create a personal brand for the business? So so it's, it's like anything else that comes down to culture, I believe. So in a business, if you look at um, values, for example, the values of my business um, or my core business, D&T, which um, was the one that I bought in and scaled up, um, our values would be professional, caring, passionate and innovative. I did a value setting exercise for myself and my personal brand, and I did it retrospectively. I should have done it at the start when I first started thinking about pushing it forward, but I did it retrospectively. And my personal values are slightly out of alignment with the business values. The business values are a um, combination of the people that made up the business at that time. The values today, despite us having those plastered on our website and the wall and so on, have probably tweaked slightly as well. So... Again, I, I think we need to remember that anything that is in a, in a company is the collection of the people within it. It isn't necessarily by design by one person or by a committee. 
but actually it's the results of what everybody else is doing day by day by day. So how does that impact when a company has different tones of voices um, across? So you might have somebody who's, um, let's say, quite adventurous in their use of the English language, and you might have somebody who's um, quite negligent when it comes to making statements that can't be substantiated and so on. Well, quite frankly, that's a, that is a problem in training, and that's a problem in control and making sure that people know what they can and can't do. Um, I, yeah, I, I certainly don't suggest that personal brands being uh, distributed through an organisation should be a free-for-all. I think that um, there should be guidelines in what you do. I mean, I, I prefer less rather than more with guidelines. And the guideline that I use personally is not to say something online, but I wouldn't say in a megaphone in a crowded pub or to my mum which kind of rules out swearing, it kind of rules out being offensive. And it, you know, it, it, it's pretty good guidelines that help keep me in the right direction. I appreciate most corporates will probably want a little bit more detail from that. But as long as you set the parameters, actually, does it matter if people use a different tone of voice? And some people are more um, flowery with their words and others are more straight to the point. Actually, that shows that they're, they're true personal statements and not a, um, a you know, one of the big four banks, I'm not going to mention who, um, where they send out the social media post, everyone has to click post on at the same time. Wow. Uh, I just want to, I just want to chime in because uh, just a couple of things I want to say. Sorry, guys. Um, no, 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 no. Oh. Uh, brilliant stuff. It's gold, Carl, honestly. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is, <clears throat> when you asked that question, Adam, my, my brain went to an example. Corporate brand is top down, is imposed, and corporate brand is what it says on the ad and how it makes you feel as a brand. So the language it uses, the sentiments and emotions it evokes, and you see you see a piece of collateral from a corporate brand, and it makes you feel lovely, and you want their service, and you buy them from that. So you call the number. Personal brand is the cheesed off receptionist that answers the phone and says, yeah, what? That's the difference. It's not controllable. It can't be contained, constrained and controlled. And so that made me then realize when you were speaking, Carl, that actually this has already happened on a massive level. I've just never realized it before. And I've realized it now. Google implemented something from way back in the early days of Google called Google Time. Most of you won't have heard of it. Uh, Carl, you might have heard of it. Even I mean, a lot of people wouldn't have. Google Time basically says um, you work five days a week. One of those days, you can do whatever you like. But if you launch something using that day, you have to give Google the first opportunity to scale it. Google Ads, Google Maps are just two of the examples of projects that came out of Google saying to their people, go and do what you care about. Those are products of unleashing personal brand, letting people be who they are. This has gone even further. Airbnb did something similar and lots of smart companies create skunk works, incubators. They create these environments where they actively understand that we will create more if we allow you to create more. And so the difference fundamentally, to answer your question, Adam, is top down versus bottom up. Personal brand cannot be controlled in the same way that a corporate brand can. But imagine a corporation with 5,000 employees who don't have to push the button on that social post. Actually, what they all do is they go and share the social post from the corporate page on their personal page with different take, different language, different hashtags. Now that creates a, an absolute tsunami of corporate brand relevant personal branded content. You can't, you can't stage that. You can't can that. You can't create and here's, that. Here's something, Gal, that I just want to add to that mix. Um, I mean, you mentioned about Google, and this is going even further off of personal brand in the traditional sense. Uh, but I want to talk about McDonald's and perhaps the most successful innovation of McDonald's. Um, what would you guys say the most successful innovation of McDonald's is? Isn't it like their systems? The systems. Simon, what would you say? Stars. The way they... Stars. Thicker milkshake. Big milkshake. Mac. Big, Big Mac. Mac. Big Mac is the answer. So um, what I didn't mention in my intro is that I'm heavily involved in the franchising world, so I know about this stuff. The Big Mac was invented by a franchisee. It wasn't a McDonald's product. It was invented by a franchisee 
who preferred to eat two burgers at once but wanted a bit of bread between them. Um, it wasn't on the menu originally. Now, a franchise is typically about control and top-down implementation of systems and processes and so on. But the fact that the franchisee was able to suggest this as, you know what, I like um, for my own personal lunch, I make up my burger this way, it became what must be the world's biggest selling burger, I imagine. Um, yeah. I, I've got no data to back that up, but I'd be surprised if any others come close. And um, I, again, it, it's by allowing that freedom, whether it is from, you know, if we look at the micro on this, i.e. how a social media post is worded, through to the macro on this, by allowing this stuff to happen and trusting the very good employees or in this case franchisees that you've got, that's where the magic comes out. Does that come back to culture again then? Because you have to have the right culture in place for that to work. And if you don't yeah. have that culture and it's not, you know, your employees haven't bought into the business, they have they aren't invested in the culture of your business, then personal brand is going to work. So it's almost like it kind of reveals all the nasty eels that might need Absolutely. to be <laughs> contained Absolutely. and sorted beforehand. Absolutely. And as I said earlier, we're just, if we are controlling brand messaging, um, and I really love the tangent this has gone on, and I've got all the time in the world if we want to carry on. Um, mm -hmm. But if, we, um, if we're trying to control brand messaging, then all we're doing is we're deferring that to, as Al said, the grumpy receptionist or whatever that comes down the line as the problem. Um, but actually, yeah, but when we think about this, coming down to um, culture and the importance of it. Look, we know that that is absolutely vital. It is the fundamental makeup of the brand is who we are as a business. And, and it's an early warning indicator, isn't it? When a brand is all command and control and no one's allowed to say anything, it's an early indicator of the culture of that business. And the opposite is true as well. When you've got a brand that's so free and chilled that people can say whatever they like, oh yeah, well now, now it's a totally different vibe. And that's what I think we're starting to see more of. We're starting to mm. see more of those relaxed, relaxed CEOs. You know, an, a, an extreme example of that is the CEO recently um, who, uh, who actually, I think sadly has gone out of business, but uh, what he did was revolutionary and he, he zeroed or he, he leveled everyone's salaries. Do you remember, he took a massive salary pay cut and said, right, we're all going to be on 70 grand. Now, it may or may not have worked as a business for lots of reasons, but but the logic of that, and I'm no, believe me, I'm a happy capitalist, but the logic of that was um, actually in a company, it's a group of people who have come together to do something, but to, all too often the company forgets that. And it loses something. Adam, I think I cut you off. You were going to say something. Well, I've got a question. It's a slight, it's a slight tangent, if I may. I know we're almost out of time. Yeah. Um, so let's say we've got a business owner. They, uh, they've they kind of created a bit of a personal brand on LinkedIn. So they're quite um, focused on their professional, you know, personal branding. Um, but they might not be sure whether or not it would make sense to extend that to their their personal social media accounts. Maybe they use Facebook and Instagram for posting, you know, family photos and connecting with close personal friends and so on. Should business owners in general be extending their their professional personal brand across, you know, all social media platforms? Uh, and, and okay, really, really good point. And I want to dive in on this one because I've got really strong views on it. Um, and first of all, just to wrap up what we were talking about on the piece just before, I touched on Michael Gerber about the um, ordinary people plus extraordinary systems mean extraordinary businesses. Um, we've demonstrated in this call how that equation is incorrect, because if you've got a business of plonkers, to use the nicest possible term, um, you've got a business of people who don't care about their customers and so on, then actually, you know, we can see how the personal brand impact, whilst it might not be publicised as part of a marketing effort, will come out at call number one, two, three, or at some point in the service delivery. Um, but to, to your point, Adam, should a um, should an individual have a separate personal brand and for work and a personal brand for personal? My strongest view on that is absolutely not. I think you should be yourself. Um, too many of us yeah. have had to live under a mask and it's really really hard um and there's a couple of counter arguments which i'll come to in a moment but just imagine if you had to run two families and family number one you're adam 
and you've got your two kids and your partner and so on and so forth. And then family number two, you've got a different name and you've got to live a completely different life. But that would be really hard to keep up with. And it might just be me. Yeah, I might just be really simple, but I know I would struggle to switch between the two. Well, we're doing exactly the same by trying to separate out our personal brand and our professional brand. We're having to say, like, Monday, 9 o'clock, I need to switch to having this tone of voice. I need to switch to having this um, approach with people I deal with, with sharing this kind of information, with not sharing this kind of information and so on. Um, so I think that that's the first challenge. The second challenge with it is that to the end viewer of it, it appears inauthentic. And yes, all those solicitors, accountants, et cetera, et cetera, in the 80s and 90s who all had their grey suits and you know, would look at the camera like this and um, you know, it would be a templated approach that they would all have. Yes, it all looked inauthentic because we know now with the power of hindsight that they lived normal lives and would go to the football or go to the rugby or whatever and spend time with their family and Yes, they wouldn't wear a three-piece suit at weekends. They would wear a polo shirt and jeans. So I, I'm a strong believer that actually we have one life and that's the life we should represent through our personal brand. The objection that commonly comes up with this is, well, I don't want um, business connections to see what I share on my personal page. Well, quite frankly, if you're sharing inappropriate comments on your personal page if you're being racist if you're being sexist if you've got extreme political views whatever it is if it's drunk enough out so on should you be sharing on your personal page let alone your business page yeah i think yeah. i mean as a follow i think it does come down to audience and platform doesn't it you know and if you are as authentic as you possibly can be and that you're you're that one person then it does come down to how far do you want to take it and what are you what which audience is going to be most most receptive to mm. that certain type of comment yeah talk in the same tone of voice take the talk with authenticity but then also think about the, the 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 content the themed content of what you want to put out there and understand if that's the right audience for it whether it should be just on linkedin and, and so on and so forth but i i learned a lesson from gary vaynerchuk again the jab 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 right hook that you've got to learn the respect in a boxing match before you can land the right hook. And although the analogy is flawed, I kind of get it. And I think it works quite nicely. Um, I'm a I'm a massive oversharer on LinkedIn of personal stuff as well as business stuff. And I will share what's going on at my weekend, what I'm feeling, if I'm high, if I'm low, and so on. I know it's a highlights reel. Um, you know, I know social media is like that all the way. And yes, my different platforms have different um different levels of the content in terms of quantity but I do make a conscious effort to integrate that content across all platforms um, LinkedIn I'm guaranteed to get far more likes on a picture I post for my wife than a picture of myself why because my wife is beautiful and I'm not exactly an oil painting um, there's there is practical realities to some of this stuff but also LinkedIn connections are being sold to on every single post. If you open up your LinkedIn, you will, um, if if you were able to date it chronologically, I don't know if you can or not, but if you are able to do a chronological non-algorithm feed, just based on who's posted what last, you would find that probably your top 99 out of 100 posts on there would be something along the lines of, this stuff has recently happened in the world, whether it's Brexit, whether it's um, the economy, whether it's politics, Queen's passed away, so buy my stuff. It will be a blatant attempt to sell under the auspices of trying to connect to something newsworthy. And then you might have one post that's actually relatable and you find interesting. The algorithm sorts a lot of that out. And what that means is, as viewers on LinkedIn or similar, we look at it and we think, oh, God, all these people are only getting likes and comments because they're posting personal stories, they're posting selfies or so on. No, they're getting the likes and comments, not because of the algorithm, but because it's genuinely interesting and people are engaging. People are clicking like, people are commenting. And yes, that's hard for some of us to take when, um, when we think, oh, why isn't my content landing? But that is, yeah, that is what it is. So... I think there's a, um, for me, I think when you're adopting a personal brand approach, 
there is a real power in sharing some of the personal stuff as well. It doesn't mean you share it all. It doesn't mean you have to share your breakfast. It doesn't mean you have to share the um, the stuff that none of us shares, which, let's be honest, is um, yeah, Monday morning at 9.30, you just can't be asked to get up. Or Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock and you're panicking about work. Or so whatever it is, the emotions we all go through, um, but we don't all share. We share the 5 a.m. club hustle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't have to share everything, but the stuff you do share, nobody just wants to follow a sales pitch. Uh, as, as gutted as I am mm. to draw a line, Carl, we're going to have to have you back for a part two on personal branding, clearly, because we've clearly only scratched the, scratched the surface. A phenomenal, uh, I mean, wider ranging discussion than I ever hoped for. Brilliant. I mean, I've got so much my brain is on fire now. I'm not going to ask you for key takeaways because we'll be here for another half an hour because there's so much. I've got, I've got four pages of notes that I've taken them from this hour. So we're definitely going to have to see if we can convince Carl to a part two, but uh, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with this thought. Um, I, I have behind me my personal life here. I cannot tell you how many clients I have more deeply engaged with because of my personal life. Uh, in answer to your question, Adam, uh, I don't see a line between personal and professional. Everything that I do in my work life relates to my personal life and almost everything I do in my personal life relates to my professional life. And I long ago uh, experienced that uh, that um, uh, that sort of dual life that Carl was talking about. And it's not workable, certainly in a world where being kind and uh, managing our mental health is prevalent and, and primary as it should be um we we can barely just about manage to communicate effectively as one human why on earth would we want to try and do it as more than one um and and i think the same is true for businesses if they could relax and unlock the power of their employee advocacy they would far, gain far more on the upside than they'd ever lose on the downside so much food for thought for everyone watching this um thank you for giving us your time we hope you've enjoyed it post comments i'll tag people in uh if you ask if you want to ask questions do it uh we'll in a month's time we'll be talking about how fixing you is key to fixing your business because there's a lot of bs up here that absolutely destroys our businesses and if you can master this business is a walk in the park carl thank you so much for being here today i, feel, I knew it would be good but i didn't think it'd be that good so thank you buddy i'm very very grateful uh no, Rachel thank you all. Added, so so exciting to even think about doing this again uh rachel adam and simon as ever uh my stalwart panel uh making sure we keep the discussion not just our our focus but wider than that thank you for being here and uh to everyone else have a good rest of the day and we will see you all again.